Um, yeah, as just mentioned, I'm here to talk about natural language processing, or in short, NLP, with JRuby and OpenNLP. Uh, my name is Konstantin Tenhardt, and I'm currently working as a Ruby developer for Flink. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is at T60. And I'm based not too far from Ghent in Darmstadt, Germany, which is about a five-hour drive from here. Before we dive into the more technical aspects of this talk, I want to briefly talk about uh, language as we use it to communicate um, amongst each other. Language has been around um, for centuries now, and it is excellent at encoding information. Even the most complex contexts can be easily encoded in information and uh, shared uh, with other people. And if we think about how language is usually used, the most prominent context is probably just talking to each other. That, of course, works only if you happen to be in the same room and the information flows from the speaker um, to those who are listening. If, of course, we happen to be at distinct places, we need to help ourselves with the use of modern technology. We could, for instance, write text messages, emails, or talk on the phone. The thing about the technology used in these scenarios is that the device does not understand at all what kind of information is relayed. For the device, language is just a series of sounds or a series of ca characters. This, of course, changes with NLP. NLP enables to un uh, machines to understand language at the semantic level. And I want to give you a little example for uh, one possible application of NLP. Imagine two people trying to communicate, but they speak different languages. And with the help of NLP, we could uh, for instance, think about a system that does real-time translation between the two languages, enabling those two people who couldn't communicate before uh, now to communicate um, in their natural language. And of course, NLP also enables a new way to interact with machines. We can simply talk to a machine and expect it to understand uh, the information we try to convey. You can think of Siri as an example. There are several applications for natural language processing. Machine translation, I already mentioned. A prominent one is also text summarization. And then there is opinion mining, where you try to extract the author's opinion in regard to a certain subject from a given text. These are all examples that are currently actively researched. And these are also examples we won't talk about today, because they are um, highly complicated. and. I wanted to show you something that you actually can try out yourself if you want. So the two examples I want to talk about today is named entity recognition, that is extracting references to locations or names of people out of a given text, and keyword extraction, that is extracting the most relevant keywords or key phrases from a text. Before we dive into these examples, I want to quickly talk about what natural language processing actually is from a computer science perspective. Natural language processing is a combination of many things. For instance, there's the software engineering part. Then, of course, there's a lot of machine learning and statistics involved. And finally, since we're talking about natural language, there is a lot of linguistics involved. When you take classes at university about natural language processing, you usually focus mostly on the linguistics and the machine learning part. As most of you are probably application developers, I want to turn it around today and focus on how you can use NLP in your own applications. In that sense, we will focus on the software engineering aspect. That said, we still need to talk about some linguistic basics. And I actually only want to introduce two concepts to you today. The first concept is part of speech, and you probably all know it from school. Part of speech, or word class, simply denotes the syntactic function of a word in a given sentence. The thing you need to be careful about is that a word can have multiple word classes depending on the position in the sentence. Just think of the word fly. 
it can be used as a noun or it can be used as a verb. And the position in the sentence determines the word class. The other concept I want to introduce to you is the concept of a word stem. A word stem is an artificial construct. And you can think of it uh, as a base form of a word. And many word stems are valid English words themselves, but there are also word stems that are simply a reduced form of a word that you couldn't use in a sentence. Think of the word negotiation and to negotiate. They both have the same word stem, negotiate, but negotiate without the E at the end is not a valid English word, yet they have the same word stem because they, have, they are highly semantically correlated. Now let's talk about the technological aspects. And let's start with why I chose Ruby in the first place to do NLP and why I decided to use JRuby. Ruby, I think, um, is undervalued when it comes to natural language processing. Many people turn to Python or to Java. But I think JRuby's or Ruby's capabilities in general regarding uh, string processing are excellent for doing natural language processing, especially the pre-processing that you always need to do can be done quite efficiently with Ruby. As for JRuby, the JVM simply is a high-performance platform that allows me to use true multi-threading, and as many of the NLP tasks are quite compute-intensive, that comes in handy as well. And finally, probably the most important reason for me to use it is that I can interface with existing Java libraries. And that is essentially what I did. One of the most prominent natural language processing libraries written in Java is OpenNLP, and it uses maximum entropy classification. As I said, I don't want to dive into the statistics or the machine learning aspects, so the only thing you need to know about uh, these kind of machine learning algorithms is that they are supervised. That is, they need to be trained before you can then actually apply them on your input data. Since finding, um, finding input data you can use for training is quite hard in the field of linguistics as it takes a lot of work to annotate texts, for instance, text with um, part of speech tags. Um, it is usually quite complicated, but in the case of OpenNLP, we are lucky again because they provide pre-trained models and you can simply download them from sourceforge.net. I made it even a little easier for you and packaged everything you need into uh, three little gems. There's a wrapper around the original OpenNLP library, and all it does is basically uh, do some of the housekeeping tasks. It provides automatic type conversion, and it unifies the interface to make, uh, make working with OpenNLP a little easier. Then there are two separate gems that simply package the model data that uh, um, you can load to uh, to train your classifiers for the English and the German language. If there's one thing you take home from this talk, then it should be these three steps, because these three steps are the essential building blocks you need uh, to use when building an NLP application with OpenNLP. No matter the, uh, the problem you try to solve, you usually start with loading the appropriate training data or training uh, classifier yourself, and once you have this model, you can initialize the classifier that is used to solve a certain NLP problem. And finally, you can actually um, perform the classification task. And I will give you a couple of examples now. So let's start with basic NLP tasks. You always need to do uh, when working with textual data. There's the problem of segmentation, and they're actually two instances of this problem, as we will see. And segmentation um, is simply uh, deals with splitting a text into a sequence of logical units. And as I said, there are multiple instances. The first one is sentence detection. Think of uh, reading a large document into your memory, and now you want to split this document into individual sentences. You might think that this is actually quite an easy task because you simply have to look for punctuation marks. And while this would work for the first example, uh, Ruby is easy, Ruby is fun, 
it wouldn't work for the second example that contains direct speech and acronyms. So splitting a text into sentences is actually much harder than it initially looks. Lucky for us, OpenNLP provides us with the appropriate mechanisms uh, to deal with this kind of problem. And as I said, there are essentially three steps. In the first line, we simply load the sentence detection model, in this case for the English language. Then we initialize the sentence detector that we will use to um, process our data. And in the third line, we simply perform the actual processing, uh, provide the process method with a string, and as a result, we get back a Ruby array where each item in the array, array is a single sentence. The second instance of this problem is tokenization. And tokenization deals with detecting word boundaries. You might think that this is even easier than uh, sentence splitting. But I can assure you, even in English, there are some less obvious cases. If you think of contracted forms, for instance, like won't, I am, or can't, these are actually two words, but would, it, uh, would simply be tokenized into one word when you simply split whenever you find white space. And then there are languages out there that have multiple valid uh, word boundaries, and there are languages that don't even have a visual representation of a word boundary. So again, using a machine learning algorithm might be a better choice. And once again, OpenNLP makes this quite trivial. Just like with sentence detection, in this case, we load a tokenization model, again, for the English language. We initialize the tokenizer, and we simply call the process method. In this case, we get back an array, but the array won't contain entire sentences, but tokens instead. Another important pre-processing task is part of speech tagging. Um, I introduced the concept of a word class earlier to you, and part of speech tagging is concerned with automatically detecting the correct word class of a given word. And in many cases, the result is given back in, encoded in the so-called uh, pen tree bank tag set format. I'll give you a short example. Again, the usual three steps, and what we get back this time is an array where each item corresponds to one token in our input data. So in this case, Ruby is tagged as NNP, which stands for proper noun. Um, the verb is is tagged as uh, VBC, which stands for a verb in present tense, and the last word is simply tagged as an adjective. We have to cover one last basic NLP task before we can move on to uh, the more complex tasks, and that is stemming. I introduced the concept of a word stem to you. Stemming is the process of automatically deriving uh, word stems uh, from a given word. And you could basically, and the algorithms basically work um, by removing the ending of a word. And in linguistics, we often refer to this as the morphological suffix. So, in negotiation, the ION at the end is basically the morphological suffix that is um, added to the word stem to form, form an actual word. And for the English language, the most prominent algorithm is by far Porter's stemmer. It isn't part of OpenNLP, but somebody wrote a little Ruby gem for that, and it actually simply acts like a core extension for the Ruby string class providing it with one more additional method called stem. And if you call it on a string, it will give you back the word stem. So let's move on to more advanced examples. So far, we have only done basic pre-processing tasks. To extract actual semantic information, and in this case, named entities, um, we have to go a bit further. All the pre-processing has still to be done. But um, now we can actually try and extract information that we can then further use. For instance, you might be interested um, in parsing dates and locations of events out of a given text. And that is what named entity recognition can do for you. With the help of OpenNLP, that is actually quite simple. And 
The example on this slide is uh, from when I first gave this talk at Yuruku in Athens. And what we try to extract here is the location of Yuruku. And in order to do so, we load an appropriate model, in this case, um, a location model, because we are interested in the location, but we could also be interested um, in the date or in both, but we would have uh, to do individual runs for each type of named entity. Again, it is just the same three-step process, but this time the processes method returns a range, an array of ranges, and these ranges correspond to named entities in our input data. So in this case, um, Athens is a named entity that just consists of one um, word, but of course there are references to names of persons or lo to locations that consist of multiple words, and this is why you actually need to have a range that basically denotes the beginning and the ending of a named entity. I now want to move on to the actual software engineering. So far we have only seen bits and pieces on how you can um, do certain na natural language processing tasks, but now we want to bring it all together and build an NLP-enabled application. The thing about natural language processing tasks is that they can often be split into several steps, uh, which then are executed simply linearly. And there's a concept in computer science called a processing pipeline. And a processing pipeline is simply a set of software components connected in series, and the output of one component acts as the input for the next component. I wrote a little gem called Composable Operations that is a very flexible implementation of these kind of processing or data processing pipelines. And uh, to follow along with the examples I will show you in a minute, you have to know two things about a gem. It consists mainly about, um, of two classes, the first one being operation. You need to inherit from this class if you want to build one software component that is part of a processing pipeline. And composed operation is then used to assemble an entire processing pipeline. So let's look at a typical NLP pipeline. Let's say you have been running a scraper, fetching data from the internet. One of the first tasks you probably do is you perform cleanup. Once you are done with removing all the unnecessary content, you will start usually with sentence detection, followed up by tokenization, and then POS tagging, and finally stemming and lemmatization. Once you're at this point, you can basically perform more advanced tasks, but in general, these are the basic pre-processing tasks um, everybody has to do when dealing with textual data. So how could such a pipeline look in Ruby? Well, composable operations makes it very easy. This is actually working code. So all we need to do is to build a class that inherits from composed operation, and then we use the macro method use to tell the pipeline which components um, it consists of. And as you could guess, um, probably guess, the order does matter. So in this case, we first perform sentence detection, then tokenization, and then POS tagging. As for the uh, individual components, they are slightly more complicated, but I uh, will walk you through the first one. As I said, an individual component inside a processing pipeline inherits from operation, and the call to processes text um, you can think of it as an alias to attribute assessor because it doesn't do much more than uh, generating uh, a pair of methods. And then every operation can have certain properties. In this case, um, we can tell the sentence detection operation whether it is uh, detecting German or English sentences. The algorithmic core of the operation goes into the execute method, and it's truly the only thing you actually need to implement. So in this case, when the processing pipeline invokes our operation, it will simply forward the text into this operation, and we then construct our sentence detector and finally use the sentence detector to split the text into an array of sentences. That said, our next operation is now not simply invoked with, um, with a single string, 
but with an array of strings. So we just have to make sure that our operation is robust enough to handle both cases. In this case, we always assume that the input data is an array, and if not, we convert it to one. And then for every element in the input array, we simply tokenize the uh, string. After that, we can move on to the POS tagging. And what happens here is, again, we iterate over the sentences. And for each sentence, we determine the individual tokens. And then we return a pair where the first element of this pair is the actual word, and the second element is the POS tag. As this is slightly more complicated, I thought it would be a good idea to provide you with the actual output um, of the entire pipeline. So providing it with the uh, two sentences, Ruby is easy, Ruby is fun, um, you will get back an array of arrays of arrays. And the innermost arrays are just the pairs of words and tokens. The next outermost arrays correspond to one sentence in your text. And of course, the outermost array uh, is just a collection of sentences. Let's move on to the last example I've got and talk about keyword extraction. The first thing you need to know about keyword extraction is that the algorithm um, I want to show you today is TextRank. And TextRank is highly influenced by Google's original PageRank algorithm. And what PageRank does, it basically constructs a graph and connects related pages um, with a link in this graph. And then you can essentially calculate a rank and determine how important uh, a certain page is in the World Wide Web. And this idea is basically what powers the text rank algorithm. But instead of pages, we look at individual words or word phrases. And there is one more concept uh, from linguistics we need to talk about first, and that is the concept of a co-occurrence. It is actually quite a simple uh, thing, a co-occurrence. In this example, Ruby is amazing. Um, we say that Ruby and amazing co-occur in our sentence with a word window size of one. And what that means is that in between the two words, Ruby and amazing, there's simply one word. And what you consider a co-occurrence depends highly on the language uh, you are processing and, of course, upon your own definition. So you can choose the word window arbitrarily large, but usually you choose it between two and five. And once you have determined all these co-occurrences, you build a so-called co-occurrence graph. And in this graph, every word that appears in your text is a node. And Words that co-occur in the text are just linked by an edge. Once you have your co-occurrence graph, you can run the entire algorithm. What we did, of course, do before building the co-occurrence graph was the usual pre-processing. Um, as the co-occurrence graph is constructed on tokens, we, of course, first need to do sentence detection, tokenization, POS tagging. The POS tagging is rather important in this example as you usually are interested in nouns and adjectives when you extract keywords because they are actually meaning bearing. Once you've done the pre-processing, you move on to calculating these co-occurrences as I just explained and then construct a graph. And finally, you run a slightly modified form of text rank. And once um, the ranking is done, you simply extract those nodes with the highest rank. Let's say you want to extract the 10 most important key phrases, then you would simply extract the 10 um, highest ranking nodes from the graph. Well, let's see how this looks in Ruby. Um, I have a simple keyword ranking operation. And there's one nice thing about composable operation I want to mention here. And a comp an operation allows an operation pipeline allows to be composed of other operation pipelines. So you can basically build arbitrary complex data processing pipelines. And in this case, we simply reuse our pre-processing pipeline um, I showed earlier, and then move on to the four steps I just mentioned, that is calculating the co-occurrences, constructing the graph, 
ranking and finally extracting it. While the internals of this code would be too complicated uh, to show here on slides, I encourage you to check out um, the repository I uh, uploaded on GitHub called uh, Keyword Extractor. And there's actually working implementation. Um, but just so you know, it is a prototypical implementation, so it's only meant to uh, be played with but not used in production. That essentially sums it up. So thank you for listening to my talk about natural language processing. You can find me on GitHub and Twitter. And that is essentially the list of uh, gems I was showing today. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions at all? Um, the main restriction is, of course, that you usually try to avoid to implement your own NLP um, libraries as they are inherently complex. Um, and what OpenNLP does, it hides all the complex machine learning operations away from you and provides you with a neat interface. You could, of course, do natural language processing entirely in Ruby and use standard Ruby, but then, of course, you would have to come up with your own implementations. The other restriction I was talking about is that most of these algorithms are rather compute intensive and the JVM um, manages to truly um, use the uh, full capacity of your underlying hardware. Answer, uh, does that answer your question? <laughs>